to Schools Out, Chapter 3, Father's Race. When Jack went to his first prep school, Tower House in East Sheen, there was much discussion as to whether or not I should compete in the father's race at the annual sports day. Please don't, Michael, said Hilary. You're bound to twist something. Or get your gout back, added Jack. At the time, I was afflicted with a hereditary gout problem. Hereditary? Right, yes. OK. Quick one. Gout is not hereditary. Gout occurs when there are high levels of uric acid in the bloodstream, which can be caused by, amongst other things, excessive alcohol consumption. But, of course, you know all of this because it's exactly what your doctor said to you when you were diagnosed with it. Ridiculous. It's not hereditary. As I lurched into my 50s, it might have helped my wife and children to view me in a more youthful light had I not been so totally inept at playing any kind of sport. John McEnroe's children must have been so proud of their older father's achievements on the tennis court, I thought. And what about all those American veteran golfers with trophy wives and adoring children running into their arms at the end of a gruelling tournament? I'd avoided teaching sport to the children, leaving that to Hillary. When it comes to sport, Hillary is Wonder Woman. She was head of games at her school, played county-level tennis and held just about every school athletics record there was. She swam like a fish, too. She still plays hockey on a regular basis, a lethal game which seems to largely involve one group of robust young women inflicting serious bodily harm upon another group as their partners look on worriedly from the touchline. There is seldom a Saturday my wife does not come home with some kind of bruising on her legs and arms, but no matter how much I try to persuade her that it might be time to pack it in, she refuses to hang up her racket. Racket? Well, bat. Bat, it's hockey. Well, mallet, then. It's a stick, a hockey stick. Oh, right, OK, OK. Hang up her stick. OK, it would be pedantic all the time. Hockey racket. Eventually, after years of avoiding instruction of my children in these matters, I decided to rack my brains for at least one skill that I could pass on to prevent my total emasculation. I came up with the idea of teaching them to drive. Don't be ridiculous, said Hilary. There is no way you could possibly teach anyone to drive and certainly not any of our children. You lost your temper after five minutes of trying to teach Jack to ride a bike and, if you remember, had Molly in floods of tears after her first lesson when you told her that bikes weren't really designed for girls to ride. Oh, God. What I actually said was that girls weren't designed to ride bikes. Oh, so much better. But anyway, driving a car is a very different kind of skill, I replied. Please don't let Daddy teach me to drive, Mummy, said Molly. The only thing I'll learn from him is how to swear or maybe to make obscene hand gestures at cyclists. When my dear mother, Nora, took her driving test for the tenth time at the age of 52, she managed to hit someone on a zebra crossing. She claimed at the time she'd been blinded by the flashing orange lights, or Belisha beacons, as they were called in those days, and hadn't seen the elderly pensioner until he'd shot across the bonnet and was staring in horror at her through the windscreen of her Hillman imp. Fortunately, he wasn't seriously hurt. When Nora returned to the test centre, she asked the instructor if she'd passed. Unfortunately not, said the instructor. If you hit a pedestrian on a zebra crossing, Mrs Whitehall, it's an automatic fail, but better luck next time. She did in fact pass on her twelfth attempt and drove really badly for the next thirty years. Jack never took me up on my offer of lessons, which with hindsight is probably a good thing, as the relationship between driver and instructor is fraught with danger. But back in his prep school days, and after much discussion, Jack had a sudden change of heart regarding my running in the father's race. But of course you should run, Daddy. All the other fathers will be, and if Trevor MacDonald is taking part and can cope, surely you can. Trevor's son, also called Jack, 
was at the school. He was one of the few fathers who made me feel slightly less geriatric. So it was decided. I was running. I would make Jack proud, even if it killed me, and I would have an opportunity to see if there was a father older than me at his school, a quest that I was on constantly throughout Jack's school days. I was meeting Superman, Christopher Reeve, for lunch later that day at the Ivy, so had arrived at the sports field in shirt, tie and suit and a very nice new pair of church's brogues that I'd recently bought in their summer sale. I told you to wear shorts, Daddy. I was then and am now a firm believer that only a certain type of man can get away with a short, and I am not one of them. I concur. Next thing you'll be telling me, you want me to wear spikes. Don't be silly, Daddy. It's a father's race, not the Olympics. But did you have to wear a suit? To appease him, I lost the jacket. <sighs> Sports day always attracted a good turnout of parents, and Hilary was in her element, catching up with all the school gossip as a fringe member of a coven of mothers who always seemed to be in the know on a range of new school developments often well before the school was aware of them. Mrs Pollock, known to her friends as Fishy, was quietly confident that her husband, Quentin, would win, having come second last year. Quentin felt that he'd been seriously interfered with at the start last year, said Fishy. He's going to be much more physical this year. Fishy had asked Hilary if I was running, and when she said I was, she told Hilary that her father had been in a father's race when she was at St Mary's Ascot, and he'd ruptured his anterior crucial... Cruciate ligament. His anterior cruciate ligament, and had had to give up sport as a result. Hilary told her that I had never been involved in any sport anyway, apart from the old game of clock golf. Clock golf? What the hell is clock golf? Is it an app? What's an app? Oh, never mind. So that wouldn't be a problem for me. Hilary told another mother, Mrs Chen, that I was having lunch with Christopher Reeve at the Ivy later, and Mrs Chen asked if I could get a table for them the following week, as whenever she rang, they were always fully booked for months in advance. Before you go any further... You can't do Mrs Chen's voice either. Father's invitation 100 metre sprint, announced the sportsmaster, Mr Townsend, through his antique loud hailer. Because, of course, I went to prep school in the 1930s. Why is it an antique? As I began to walk towards the starting line, Hilary and Jack ran after me. Please, Michael, you really don't have to do this. Why don't you let me run for you instead, said Hilary. Don't be ridiculous, it's the father's race. And anyway, you're running in the mother's sack race, I said. Don't worry, I promise you I'll be fine. But please be careful, said Jack. It will be so embarrassing if you fall over. In fact, I nearly fell over in the melee of fathers jockeying for position on the starting line. Inside lane for me, shouted an aggressive young father to his wife as he jogged off in the direction of the headmaster, Mr Beale, who was brandishing a lethal-looking starting pistol. Probably an antique musket. I was beginning to feel like I was in evil in war's decline and fall. Good luck, said Jack, slapping me on the back and slightly winding me. I was six. How feeble were you? I'm sure you'll be fine. Just remember to dip your head at the finishing line in case it's close. And don't try to show off, said Hilary. As I jostled for a good starting position, I was balked by a small athletic-looking Hong Kong banker type whom I recognised as Mr Chen. His son Harvey was in Jack's year and one of the most competitive friends, always beating him at everything. I saw this as an opportunity of getting even with the Chen family. Mr Chen looked patronisingly at my footwear and asked, ''Don't you have any other shoes?'' ''There you are, you see that yeah, voice?'' good, it's perfect. I was worried, but yeah, he fine. pulled it yeah, off. Yeah. Good. Okay. ''No, actually,'' I replied, wondering whether I should tell him that they were new and that I was running them in. But I remember that he had absolutely no sense of humour. I then noticed his footwear. He was wearing running shoes, complete with spikes. I'm more of a 400 metres man myself, he said, chugging from a bottle of 
isotonic Lucasade before slinging it to the ground behind him. But I'm going to do my best. Mr. Beale gave a short speech to the assembled fathers, thanking us for coming and reminding us that it was the taking part that mattered and warning us not to be too competitive. It's important that the children don't think that we are taking this too seriously, otherwise they'll be very upset if their fathers end up at the rear of the field. For some reason, Mr. Beale seemed to be staring at me when he said this. The fathers began to take their starting positions, as Mr. Beale called them in. They all looked half my age, and typically, Trevor MacDonald had had to take an urgent call on his mobile and had withdrawn. I was so annoyed. I could have beaten him, I thought. Hmm. My money would have firmly been on Trevor. On your marks. All the other fathers knelt down and put their hands against the line. Quentin Pollock flexed his elbows. I opted for a standing start, a little concerned that if I went down to a crouching sprinter's start, I might never get up from it. Get set! I got off to a flying start, having massively jumped the gun. I was a full three metres in front of an irate Mr Chen. But unfortunately, within seconds, the church's brogues began to even things up. They may have had a 100% leather sole and heel, but they were certainly no good on 100 metres worth of slightly damp and very uneven turf. As I slithered my way to the back of the field, puffing like a traction engine, I felt a shooting pain across my chest. My God, I thought, I'm having a heart attack. Now that would really embarrass Jack and Hilary. I could see the finishing tape in the distance as I began to lose my balance. If only Superman were here and not waiting for me at the Ivy, he'd know what to do. And then I ran into the geography teacher, Mr Wright, who was standing at the finish with a clipboard. I'm afraid you were last, he said helpfully, by about 30 metres. More like 40. I'd never been a fan of Wright, but seeing as I'd lost most of the feeling in my legs, I was grateful for his supportive shoulder. Mr Chen, to no one's surprise, won, followed by six foot five inches worth of Quentin Pollock, whose dipped head took a lot longer to hit the tape than Mr Chen's. Quentin, having picked up the silver medal for the second year running, looked far from pleased. The only consolation I could take from the race was at least I didn't fall over. Well, at least you didn't fall over, Jack said, death staring a rather smug looking Harvey. Perhaps you shouldn't have worn those new shoes, said Hilary perceptively. Get your father a glass of water, Jack, said Mr Beale. He looks a bit flushed. I declined the water, but had a sit down on a bench by the side of the track. The pain across my chest had diffused. It was probably wind, said Hilary, who by this point was beginning to limber up for her race, which was next. Mr Beale came and sat down next to me. Well done, sir, he said. I stopped taking any kind of exercise myself after my 60th birthday. I'd take it easy if I were you. As I was only in my early 50s at the time, I wasn't that keen on being put into the over 60s category by the headmaster. Surely I didn't look as old as him. We had an older father like you here a couple of years ago who insisted on taking part in the father's race, he said. He overran the finishing line and broke his ankle, falling into a pile of deck chairs. He was devastated, and so were his children. He came last, just like you, poor bugger. Forgive me, I've got to go. Start of the sack race. I got to the Ivy, didn't book a table for the Chens, but arrived just in time to buy Christopher Reeve a pre-lunch drink. I could have done with some help from the Man of Steel this morning, I said, and explained. Let me know if I can help in the future, he said, grinning. Great shoes, incidentally. Hillary won the mother's sack race in a school record time. Chapter 4. The Reluctant Dragon Jack didn't want to go to boarding school. He'd been propping up the bottom of his classes at Tower House School and had had an extremely difficult time with one particular teacher. Rosie Sweetman was waiting for Jack on his first day at the school, a charmless, gawky giraffe with what my mother-in-law would have called an unfortunate manner. Absolutely terrifying woman. 
The kind of lady who every time she has an orgasm, a fairy dies. Miss Sweetman was a bizarre choice to teach a reception class of four-year-olds. Halfway through his first year, Hilary and I were called in to see her for a meeting. Jack is doing mirror writing, said Miss Sweetman, as she peered down at us from her desk, having strategically placed us on two of the mini chairs used by her pupils. And that being what exactly? I asked her. Well, he writes backwards, so you can only read his writing if you hold it up to a mirror. She explained very patronizingly. The boy's a genius. How amazingly clever of him! Hilary replied, having not a shred of a sense of humour. She was a huge fan of the Chen family. She snapped back to Hilary that mirror writing was a sign of deep anxiety and distress. I have to ask you: Is there anything going on at home that I should know about? Anything that might be worrying him? I was losing patience with this dreadful woman. I beg your pardon, madam. I replied. Is everything all right between you two? She ploughed on, failing to pick up my tone. I noticed at this point that she was peering down at my wife's arms. Two days previously, Hillary's hockey team had come through a feisty encounter with the Leatherhead Ladies' second eleven that had left her sporting a vicious-looking bruise on her arm and astro turf grazes on both elbows. Racket marks. I can assure you that everything is, and I can't see how this can possibly be any of your business. I said. If there is anything upsetting him, it's clearly happening in your classroom. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, let's see if it sorts itself out," she said. "But if it continues, you might have to consider some counselling for him." Counselling! I shouted. "You're the one who needs counselling." As I tried to make a dramatic exit from her classroom, I realised that I was attached to the small plastic chair that I'd been sitting on. Undeterred, I waddled towards the door in the hope that it would drop off. But all decorum was lost when Hillary had to start tugging at it to remove it from my backside. Fortunately, Jack did manage to sort himself out, and the C word was never mentioned again. But this just underlined our view that Miss Sweetman may have been sweet by name, but she certainly wasn't by nature. Four years later, as Jack was about to transfer to the senior school. We had a letter from the new headmaster telling us that, following discussions with Miss Sweetman, they had decided that her talents would be put to better use with an older year group. They had decided to move her to take charge of the upper school's reception class, where Jack was bound. This was the last straw. It was bad enough that Jack's interest in art and drama at Tower House had been squashed, due in part to the emergence of a young boy two years above him by the name of Robert Pattinson, who seemed to get all the juicy roles that Jack aspired to in school plays: Peter Pan, Joseph, Bugsy Malone. Yeah, but he was better with the ladies. Um, him, he he was better with the ladies. He was. Better at everything. It was a pleasant enough young man who came to me for professional advice some years later. Did I think that Robert had any future in the world of acting? I strongly advised him to avoid it at all cost, and told him sagely, "It's a very crowded profession, Robert, and I think it's highly unlikely that there will be room for you in it." Although I have not followed his career in any detail. I gather he's had a modicum of success, in which I can only wish him well. He's done all right. I knew that Jack was a bright and interesting boy, and that his artistic talents needed nurturing. Sadly, the headmaster thought differently. Where were you thinking of sending him next? He asked us. Well, we'd hoped to get him into Marlborough College. I replied. <laughs> I don't think so. He laughed. Not a hope, Dick. So it was goodbye. Tower House. Way back in the mists of time, well, the early 1960s, I was unbelievably a prep school teacher myself. 
I remember an interview with the educational agency Gabbitus Thring, which had a number of teaching vacancies on its books, none of which suited me as they were either for subjects that I was hopeless at, i.e. the vast majority, and usually involved games coaching, something I certainly wouldn't have known where to start with. At my own school, I was forced to play rugby. The only skill I acquired was how to convincingly bend down and do up my shoelaces as a six-foot brick shithouse from the opposition charged towards me in search of a try. Were you good at passing the rugby puck? On one occasion, in a school match, I was even suspected of having fixed the result for the opposition. Such was the number of flunked tackles I managed to complete, and this in the days well before the match-rigging scandals involving betting syndicates in the Far East. "'It doesn't do to be too modest, my son,' said Mr Levy of Gabitus Three. "'It's Whoa. amazing what Whoa. one can teach what is one that? Cries. "'What are you doing? What? What? What, what voice is that? Well, this is my Jewish voice for you Mr. Levy. You can't do a Jewish voice. Why? I've told you there are no ethnic voices at all in this book. You can't do that. So what? You make, you just give him a boring, just ordinary voice. Just give him a boring. Don't you can't. What was that? Okay, fine. Okay. It doesn't do to be too modest," said Mr. Levy of Gabbitus Thring. It's amazing what one can teach if one tries. I queried the games at a particular school which he'd selected out of his file of vacancies. Don't worry, he assured me. As long as you keep them quiet, the headmaster will be happy. Just stand around in a tracksuit and make sure you have a loud whistle. And don't worry too much about teaching anything at this stage. Just make sure you stay at least one lesson ahead of them. And when I asked him about an interview, he said... Not really necessary for this one, to be honest. They're pretty desperate. He's actually got two vacancies, as the head of maths has run off with a young French teacher, and the term starts next week. He'll probably just want a quick chat over the phone. My letter of engagement from the school was a work of fiction. It mentioned my Oxford geography degree and the fact that I had been a member of the Ampleforth College First Eleven cricket team but not that I was, in fact, the first 11 scorer because of my neat italic writing. Unfortunately, this resulted in me taking over all the games coaching. Having successfully managed to stay ahead of my 12-year-old charges, batting away awkward questions like, where is Addis Ababa, sir? With very good question, Bailey. First boy to show me where it is on this atlas will get a house point. Where is it? Kenya? No, it's not in Kenya. It's Kenya as well, not Kenya. Oh, God. I left the teaching profession for pastures new. For some inexplicable reason, I was approached some years later by the Sunday Times to write a series of pieces about prep schools. So with a former teaching friend, Peter Nash, I was sent around the country visiting schools and putting together a very partial top 20, which was mostly based on the quality of the entertainment offered to us by the various headmasters, a yardstick which would definitely not be appropriate in these more league table and results-driven times. In the end, Peter and I ended up visiting over 80 schools in order to end up with a top 10, and the Dragon School came first. The headmaster was a wonderful, charismatic, eccentric, and the children were full of energy and spirit, mostly out of control, but in a nice way, and everyone, pupils and staff alike, seemed to be very happy, and not a cane in sight. So when it came to moving, Jack, there was only one destination. I had always been a great admirer of the Dragon School. It had an impressive list of artistically inclined alumni. Sir John Mortimer, Lady Antonia Fraser, Sir John Betjeman. Dom Jolly. Oh, I know. Dom Jolly from Trigger Happy yes, TV. Okay. Well, yeah, I'd say distinguished and was the kind of hothouse in which Jack's creative talents could thrive. Another advantage of the Dragon was that it was just an hour's drive from our house and a boarding school. Jack was at a tricky age to have permanently under our roof, and I thought a boarding education might help to straighten him out. Additionally, I was in the process of relocating my offices in Gloucester Road to our home in Putney, 
and his bedroom had been secretly earmarked as a perfect space to house a considerable number of filing cabinets and assorted office paraphernalia. That was the real reason, wasn't it? You cold-hearted bastard. And a word on the office paraphernalia that I was forced to house in my bedroom. Um, the office paraphernalia was moved in the moment I stepped out the door. I wanted my room to be my own little pied-à-terre, you know, lava lamps, mini basketball hoop, bean bags to chill out on with my mates. Instead, when I came back from my first ever exiat holidays, I had to lie in a bed staring at three of the biggest filing cabinets you have ever seen. Do you know how uncool that is when you're talking to your friends? Hey guys, come over to mine for a sleepover. Ooh, Jack, have you got a PlayStation? No, but I do have several copies of Tim Pickett Smith's The Jewel in the Crown contract or John Le Messier's residual statements for Dad's Army. They're jolly interesting things to have. No, they weren't. John Le Messier's Dad's Army uh, Residual statements. Yes, that means the repeats he gets for yeah, Dad's I know what Army. Yeah, I know what they were. Twelve-year-old boys didn't want to look at that. So I, wanted cool. a, I wanted a PlayStation. Have my friends come over and play FIFA. Not look how much... John Le Messier got paid. He's called John Le Measurer. That's his correct name. John Le Measurer. Doesn't make him any more interesting. Um, okay. It was indicated to me that subject to a meeting with the headmaster Roger Trafford and the director of studies and the satisfactory outcome of a short test, a place could be made available to Jack. A couple of weeks later, we drove up to Oxford with the usually hyperactive Jack, very sulky in the back of the car. He gave us the silent treatment all the way there as I wax lyrical about his potential new school that had produced so many talented individuals. And the composer Sir Lennox Barclay Jack, who was renowned for the beauty of his variations on an Elizabethan theme. Neville Shute, author of A Town Like Alice, and Leonard Cheshire, who founded the Cheshire Homes for Disabled Servicemen and was awarded the VC during the Second World War. All probably current members of the Garrett Club. <sighs> but even these illustrious names left the ten-year-old Jack cold. On arrival at the school, we were ushered into the headmaster's study overlooking the impressive playing fields. Jack sat on a window seat, Hilary and I on a sofa in front of Mr Trafford's desk. We drank coffee, Jack declined a soft drink. While we exchanged pleasantries with Mr Trafford about the traffic on the M40, the weather and other matters of huge relevance, I noticed that Jack, over on the window seat, seemed to have developed a physical strain of Tourette's. His legs hung loosely in front of him, his arms likewise, and he kept jerking his head in the direction of Roger Trafford and swivelling his tongue around in his mouth, a performance that looked to me as though it had been modelled on Damien in The Omen. I checked Jack with a glance that he deliberately ignored. I saw right through his little ploy. So, Jack, why do you want to come to the dragon? asked Mr Trafford. Before Jack had time to ignore the question, Hilary filled in the expected silence, going into full flattery mode. Well, of course, Mr Trafford, the school has such a wonderful reputation, particularly since you became headmaster. And with Jack's talents in art and drama, I'm sure he would make the most wonderful contribution. I looked over at my son, who was now perilously dangling a globule of saliva from his mouth, over Roger Trafford's rather expensive-looking carpet. I've arranged for Richard Gordon, our Director of Studies, to come over and take Jack through a few simple tests, said Roger, as the door opened and Mr Gordon came into the room. Ah, Jacques, comment allez-vous? said Mr Gordon with a welcoming smile. What? said Jack. Well, four years of learning French at Tower House had obviously paid off, I thought, and at least he'd spoken, even though it was not the response Mr Gordon had been looking for. He didn't get up from his seat, nor did he shake Mr Gordon's proffered hand, and now, with an increased audience, he decided to up his twitch, which began moving down his legs. So I've heard a lot about what a lively and amusing character you are, Jack. Jack 
totally ignored Mr. Gordon, too busy pressing his tongue against the window beside him. I did not lick the window. Jack trailed off with Mr. Gordon, and Hilary took the opportunity to up the charm offensive with Mr. Trafford, asking him about his family and even feigning an interest in golf. Half an hour later, with Hilary's very limited golfing knowledge exhausted, Jack returned. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Whitehall, Jack and I had a very interesting chat, didn't we, Jack? Jack remained mute, but shook his head. I'll discuss the results of the test with Mr. Trafford, said Mr. Gordon, and we'll come back to you. With 20 years of agency behind me, I recognise the tone of his voice only too well. It's the same tone casting directors adopt when you attempt to foist a client on them who's totally wrong for a part. Would Nigel Havers be a good idea for John McLean in Die Hard? Huh? We'll come back to you, Mr. Whitehall. As we left the study, Mr. Trafford made to shake Jack's hand, but Jack shied away from him like the village idiot. Say goodbye to Mr. Trafford, I said to Jack, digging a hand into his shoulder. Jack mumbled. Is that true? Nigel what? Havers is John McLean? Yeah. Oh, my God, that would have been the most amazing bit of casting ever. Mm. Why didn't he get that job? I don't know. I mean, he might have not been quite right for it. Hans Gruber definitely would have got away with taking the money if Nigel Havers had been playing John McLean. Well, I know Where's John McLean? Um, he appears to be flirting with all of the hostages. Yippee Kaye, motherfucker. I've no idea what you're talking about because I never saw the film. But brilliant uh, film. I I didn't see it because I, I just couldn't believe that they didn't want Nigel. I know. There's a I lot. Thought, of why film. should I give them money buying tickets to go and see their their boring film? There's a lot of films that I think would be improved by Nigel Havers. Absolutely. Shaft. Yeah. And then he was, he, I th thought he should have got that part that Gene Hackman ended up playing in the, the French Connection. Yeah, again. I think every part on TV and film should be Nigel Havers. He'd make a brilliant Luther as well. Doctor Who? Well, he should certainly have got that Doctor Who part, rather than that sweary man. He'll be terrible as Doctor Who. As we drove out of the school gates... Jack ignored the waving registrar, Mr. Devitt, too busy chewing the sleeve of his jumper. But then, as suddenly as it had started, his tourettes completely disappeared and he began to speak in a normal voice. What the hell was that all about? I asked him. I want to stay at Tower House with my friends and I don't want to go to boarding school, Jack replied. I don't think there's much likelihood of them wanting you here anyway. And they didn't. Mr. Devitt rang the following morning to let us know that Jack's test results were very disappointing. His IQ test came out at 60. That's only a couple of points above mentally retarded, I said down the phone. Well, we don't actually use that definition as a yardstick, Mr. Whitehall, but yes, it's in that ballpark. Looking at some of the answers he gave on his test paper, it would appear that Jack has severe learning difficulties. And to be candid... I'm afraid we don't think that the Dragon is the right school for him. A lot of children here are big personalities. I don't think Jack would be able to cope. He seems to be a very shy boy. I think a day school would be more suitable for him. I got Jack into my study and reported my conversation with Mr. David to him. So he agrees with me that a day school would be more suitable, said Jack. How dare you make a fool of mummy and me in public, I replied. It wasn't public, he said, and 60 sounds quite high to me. I know exactly what your game is, and you're not going to get away with it. Mr. Devitt spoke to Mr. Gordon, Mr. Gordon spoke to Mr. Trafford, and it was finally agreed that Jack would be allowed a second interview, having clearly sabotaged the first. But before that happened, we made a deal. I took Jack for a walk in Richmond Park. Sorry, I've just gone a bit burpy there. <laughs> Charming. We shouldn't drink whilst we do these recordings. But before that happened, we made a deal. I took Jack for a walk in Richmond Park, and while we were feeding the ducks, I told him that if he agreed to go to the Dragon and give it a try, he could leave at half term if he really didn't like it there. Do you promise? asked Jack. Yes, I promise, I replied. We hugged. As I'd hoped, he loved it there, got into the old school play and made lots of friends for life 
and I was very proud of the way he quickly and enthusiastically embraced the life of a dragon. Would I have agreed to let him leave if he hadn't liked it there? What do you think? Not in a million years. Not necessarily. Chapter 5 Touchline Tantrums As my father has already made clear, he ain't a gifted sportsman. The closest he gets to any cardiovascular activity is walking past an exercise bike in his bedroom, bought on a whim after a heart tremor, and, having been used only once, quickly becoming an inanimate device from which to hang his Turnbull and Asser shirts. He did also once play a game of cricket in our garden, but had to retire after the second delivery hit him square in the particulars, out PBW for a duck. But that was literally it in terms of him and sport. However, his own physical deficiencies in no way prevented him from being my greatest critic when it came to me playing sport. He was a fiercely competitive touchline parent, whom you did not want to let down in a hurry. Imagine a slightly more effeminate Judy Murray. I'm surprised you can even turn in the water with a rudder that small, I remember him jokingly telling me after I disappointed him at a school swimming gala. I was 11. He wasn't always purely negative. Sometimes he'd weighed in with his own unique brand of advice. This was, if anything, worse than the abuse. I'll have you know, Jack, that my tenure as head of games at Great Ballard Preparatory School in the early 1960s resulted in unbeaten seasons for the school in rugby and football. So I think I'm more than qualified to comment on all things relating to school sports coaching. Mm. Some people have said that this record was only due to a Persian boy <sighs> called Parnian, linchpin of my squads and indeed top scorer in all three sports. He was over six foot tall, shaved twice a day and regularly beat me at arm wrestling, although I would dispute this allegation, as indeed I disputed accusations from opposition teachers that Parnian was over age, the headmaster having assured me that he had had sight of his birth certificate. Mm -hmm. What you were doing arm wrestling, your pupils is anyone's guess. Anyway, I'll continue. At Marlborough College, my secondary school, having failed to get picked by my coach for the second 11 football team for the third week running, my father suggested a ploy he'd picked up from the school he'd attended in the 1930s. 1950s. There's meat somewhere in the middle. 1940s. Tell the headmaster that your coach, Mr Brian, has been touching you, he said down the phone. It worked in my day. What, and get him arrested? Arrested? No, they'll just move him on without a fuss. The problem is, Dad, you went to a Catholic school in the last century. That sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. Well, that's a damned shame, particularly for the second eleven. It's safe to say that my father and Mr Brian didn't really get on. Mr Brian was an eccentric teacher who'd been at the school for years. He had an intense manner, a wild mop of hair and a horrible, grisly beard. Here my father saw eye to eye on virtually nothing. My dad as a fee-paying father, was of the opinion that his son should have the divine right to play in any team he wanted. If I wanted to be in the girls' third eleven hockey team at five and a half grand a term, it was fucking happening. Unfortunately, Mr Brian, quite understandably, thought otherwise. I'd been left out of the football squad altogether for the first three matches of the term. Has that ludicrous man picked you yet? No, Dad. He doesn't think I work in the team's system. System? What system? It's a school bloody football team, not the Champions League. I'll tell you the system that does work, the direct debit system that pays your school fees every month and that ridiculous man's salary. As luck would have it, a couple of injuries halfway through the season and a change of heart from Mr Bryan meant that I was selected to represent the school's second eleven for the first time ever. And in the starting lineup, no less. I called my dad excitedly. Dad, I'm in the team. Marvellous! What did you tell him? Fumble in the showers? Cheeky hand on your tracksuit at the back of the coach? No, Dad. I got in on my own merit, I boasted, deciding to hold back the information that a large proportion of the school, including most of my team, had been hit by a mumps epidemic. My parents insisted on coming to watch me play, even though the match was at a school in the deepest, darkest depths of Devon. A very long trip for them to make, but my starts were so rare that it was apparently well worth making the journey. 
The match day arrived, and I lined up on the touchline, really looking the part. I bought the most expensive football boots I could find, plus an Alice band for my hair, so I'd look like one of those expensive Argentinian wingers. I crossed myself as I walked out onto the pitch. I was doing that nose-blowing thing where players block one nostril and messily exhale with the other, well in advance of kick-off. The only things I was missing, in fact, were my parents, who still hadn't arrived. A word about wearing the expensive clobber. Basically, it's like wearing a kick-me sign on your back. All the people you play against take one look at you and think, quite justifiably, let's hospitalise the twat in the hairband. I discovered this very soon after kick-off. Following a batch of aggressive slide tackles from my opposite number, I decided that I'd spend the rest of the half standing as close to the touchline as I could and avoid contact with the ball at all costs. It's a style of play that more recently has been deployed by Emmanuel Adebayor, but I think I pioneered it. The half dragged on, with Mr. Bryan shouting and making totally incomprehensible hand gestures at me. He was one of those teachers who, no sooner had he pulled his socks over the hems of his tracksuit bottoms and hung a shitty whistle from his neck, forgets that he's coaching 14-year-olds and honestly believes that he's Jose Mourinho. But still no parents. Then, with about five minutes to go before half-time, I saw my mother bounding towards the field with my father, clearly in a mood, stomping along behind her. They'd obviously got lost and had an argument, but at least they were here now. That's what mattered. Exactly my point to your mother. The whistle blew. Thank God, it was half-time. I could sit in my mum and dad's car with the heating on for 15 minutes. Jack! Jack! shouted Mr Brian, throwing his hands around as a boy took off his tracksuit next to him. It turns out it wasn't half-time. I was being subbed after only 20 minutes of the game. I got over to the touchline just in time for my father to arrive. "'What the hell is going on, Brian?' he said. "'Sorry, Mr Whitehall, I'm subbing Jack,' Brian explained. "'He's been totally out of the game.' Normally, it's the manager giving the hairdryer treatment, but not on this occasion. "'What do you mean, out of the game? "'Jack was clearly conserving energy until we arrived.' "'It did cross my mind, though, that Brian might have removed Jack "'because his hairband and other Nancy boy paraphernalia were causing far too much amusement amongst the opposition. Sorry, I'm giving Bennett a run around. Bennett? Listen, Brian, do you see Bennett's parents on the touchline? Shouted my dad. Said calmly, but with authority. No, they haven't made the effort, whereas we have driven halfway across the bloody country to this godforsaken dump of a school. Get my son back on immediately. Mr Whitehall, I'm afraid that is not how it works. By this point, the referee had intervened and my father was, in footballing terms, issued with a touchline ban. We spent the rest of the match sitting in the car with my father fuming as my mother insisted we stay and support the team. One of Hillary's more annoying habits, when it comes to supporting school events, I have absolutely no interest whatsoever in other people's children which is why during Jack's 13 years of education, I never attended a single prize-giving. Cheap shot. Well, this is brilliant, said my father. Spending my Saturday afternoon watching other people's ugly children kicking a ball around a field in the middle of a benighted backward county populated by a load of inbred farmhands. It was a very tense drive back to London for the weekend exeat. Oh, and Marlborough lost 4 nil. Bennett scored an own goal. The football season continued. My father served his ban and showed little interest in watching me play again. My performances, however, improved, and I'd managed to patch things up with Mr Bryan after the incident in Devon. By the end of the season, I'd become a vital linchpin of the second eleven midfield. Our final game of the season was a tough home fixture against a Welsh school called Monmouth. I'd been begging my father to come and support me. After some persuasion, he agreed on the proviso that, one, he wouldn't have to talk to Mrs O'Brien, and two, if I got subbed, he could leave. He arrived very early, so Mr O'Brien couldn't, quote, fuck him around for a second time. As the match kicked off, the touchline was packed with parents from both schools, as well as the school's respective headmasters prowling along it. Mr Brian and my father stood on opposite sides of the field, a distance that my father said wasn't far enough. Monmouth was predominantly a rugby school, based in the middle of the Welsh Valleys, so their team, as you might imagine, contained quite a few big units. You were clearly right to give up geography early. Monmouth, or Monmouth, as I 
pronounce it, is on the fringes of the Wye Valley, not part of the Welsh Valleys. Monmouth certainly weren't afraid of the physical side of the beautiful game. Just as well, then, you had banned that camp hair ban for this match. They would have murdered you. Their tackles took no prisoners, but that was no excuse for my father to shout thugs at the top of his voice every time one of them made contact with me. The opposition may have been big units, but they were still only 14 years old. My father's insistence on standing apart from Mr. Brun also meant that he was very much at the Monmouth end of the field, surrounded by the boy's parents, who were by now a little pissed off, as was the Welsh school's headmaster. This did nothing to put him off his heckling. You bloody animals! he shouted as one of the Monmouth defenders barged me off the ball. It was becoming a little uncomfortable. Some of the offended fathers began tutting and shushing him, but this just seemed to encourage my father to become even more aggressive. At half-time, I dodged the team talk to give my dad one of his own. Can you please behave? I begged him. Behave? I'm the only one shouting. Yeah, I know that, Dad. That's why I want you to stop. The second half got underway, and the chorus of abuse from the touchline continued. Thugs! Oikes! Yubbos! I think he even called their goalkeeper a donkey. Both headmasters were looking very uneasy. With the game still poised at nil-nil, a trip in the box, or was it a dive, prompted the referee to award a penalty to Monmouth. So you cheat as well, bellowed my dad. It's a bloody disgrace. Or give it a rest, shouted one of the parents, no longer willing to remain silent. I assume that voice was supposed to be Welsh. Yeah. I thought you said you didn't approve of... Yeah, you can do... Welsh Cliche. Is fine. No. no. Welsh is fine. You're allowed to do Welsh. You can't do Antiguan or Jewish. No. Welsh, OK. Right. Can you tell your granddad to shut up? No. What? The, the, these are sort of ludicrous, sort of voices. comedy, They're not comedy. abusive That's how Welsh. Welsh. Talk. We're, we're hoping for a lot of sales of this in Wales. So just. Calm down on the accents, please. Okay. Can you tell your granddad to shut up? The penalty taker asked that doesn't me. Doesn't even sound yeah, that Welsh. That is a no, Welsh accent. Gone. That is how Welsh people talk. You just don't hang out with many Welsh people. I have many Welsh friends. Uh, you weren't after this. Can you tell your granddad to shut up? The penalty taker asked me. It's gone at a bit the top of his voice. Now, yeah, the just end. stop it. Now you're he putting me under pressure. started Welsh, then he went all posh. Fine. You're putting me under pressure, and it was fine before. He said in a thick Welsh accent, in a very good thick Welsh accent. I don't know whether it was because my father heard this or whether he was just incensed at the referee's decision, but I could see that he had that look in his eyes. The Michael Mist. The one he gets when he watches Fiona Bruce on the Antiques Road show. The one he gets when cyclists cut him up on the King's Road, or when he sees pictures in the Daily Mail of Peter Mandelson on holiday with his Brazilian boyfriend. I have no problem with Fiona Bruce. You always bring her up. I have no problem with her at all. She's an attractive young woman and was a perfectly adequate newsreader. However, my problem with her is that she has no knowledge of antiques whatsoever and the ousting of the television legend Michael Aspel from the Antiques Roadshow was an outrage. And what about Peter Mandelson? That's another story. Back to the story. The penalty. The Monmouth boy took a few steps back from the ball, ready to strike it and win the game. The crowd fell silent, all eyes on the spot. He ran up, swung his leg back, and just as he was about to make contact with the ball, there was a loud, guttural sheep noise from the touchline. <coughs> I didn't even need to look round to know where it came from. The boy completely scuffed his kick as a small, pitch-side brawl broke out, with several angry parents having to be held back from hitting my dad. All you needed was a few flares and it was like watching footage from the terraces of a local derby game in Belgrade, just with a few more barber jackets. To this day, my father remains the only Marlborough College parent ever to receive a lifetime touchline ban. <laughs>